Somebody asked the other day, why do we love Dazed and Confused so much? The movie that put Richard Linklater on the map and launched multiple careers is a staple of the indie cinema resurgence of the 1990s, and its merits go far beyond the surface pleasures. There's the iconic soundtrack, of course, which is filled with some of the great songs of the 1970s, the timeless moments that ably extract humor from the most sincere forms of expression, and even the way Linklater captures the spirit of youth at a transitional time in our lives. But ultimately, what has allowed this movie to endure and find fans with each new generation is the way the various characters relate to each other and what they do and say when they are together. In other words, how they hang out. I get older, they stay the same age. <laughs> If storytelling, as in the telling of stories, is encoded in our DNA as humans, something we naturally gravitate towards and want to consume, so is hanging out. The pleasure of being with another person or a group of people with or without a larger goal will always strike an emotional chord, and we as viewers will always have our curiosity piqued when it's unfolding in our screens. Of course, hangout movies are few and far between because they often don't involve complex plotting, big action scenes, or even big marketable stars. Because of that, hangout movies have always carried smaller budgets and have been produced mostly at an independent level. They tend to be intimate, fairly low-stakes stories that center around coming-of-age narratives and the various facets that friendships can have. Still, what the least successful Hangout movies miss is that just because the story is loose, it doesn't mean there isn't a plot or a driving force propelling the narrative forward. Especially after Star Wars borrowed from Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, general audiences have been thought to think big. Big characters, big goals, big adventures, big visuals, big spectacle. But at the core of any movie is the basic relationship between two or more people. It's not always big or spectacular, but it's what our brains cling to, whether we're conscious of it or not. It's that element in particular that takes center stage in hangout movies, and someone like Linklater is a master of this particular form because he thinks deeply about his characters. Although hangout movies tend to share the same overall DNA, they can take different shapes and thematic preoccupations. Hello? Whit Stillman's Doom Bourgeoisie trilogy, for example, remains a singular series of movies in the history of cinema, American or otherwise. Metropolitan, Last Days of Disco, and Barcelona are all vastly different, but Stillman's fingerprint is unmistakable. His characters are loquacious and acerbic, often consumed by champagne problems, lost in the foibles of their own privilege. Through Stillman's memorable and ever-quotable writing, we're shown a unique point of view and an unmistakable life philosophy that despite not being exactly grounded, still resonates at a deeper level. Okay, anything I did that was wrong, I apologize for. But anything I did that was not wrong, I don't apologize for. After all, when we strip it all down, we're left with relatable themes of identity and acceptance. More than anything, his characters are at odds with their neuroticism in their pursuit to feel accepted and at home within a certain setting and group of people. Whether it's in New York or Barcelona, the most important thing is for them to be a part of a community that understands them for who they are. Noah Baumbach operates on a similar frequency, although he cranks up the emotional dial, and often to touching results. His early outings like Kicking and Screaming and The Squid and the Whale, for example, share Stillman's intellectual approach, always creating a bit of a distance between the characters and the audience. But then Bombeck hits you with an emotional sucker punch, and suddenly these characters reveal a different, much more open and vulnerable core that we can't help but feel for. Let's take the Salinger-esque The Meyerowitz Stories, a movie in which the comedy stems from a place of residual pain. The Meyerowitz siblings are charged with cumulative emotional baggage, a product of the behavior of their self-absorbed father, whose shadow looms large over everything they do. Through the expert deconstruction of complex family dynamics, often observed coldly and analytically, Baumbach delves into how children usually pick up toxic and destructive habits from their parents and carry them into adulthood, leading to decades-spanning frustrations that come out in passive-aggressive fashion. Adam Sandler and Ben Stiller's characters personify this better than any other, but it's through Elizabeth Marvel, the quiet, pushover sister, that the movie finds its emotional center when she finally stands up against her brothers who've been sucking up so much of the family's emotional oxygen. I could smash every car in this parking lot and burn the hospital down and it wouldn't unfuck me up. This leads to a profoundly affecting moment between the siblings that finally sees them on the same page, perhaps for the first time ever. 
The cinema of Nicole Hall of Center also slots very nicely into this type of movie. The filmmaker broke into the scene with a wonderful walking and talking, in which several Gen Xers go to video stores, speak on landlines, smoke pot while folding laundry, wax poetic about relationships, spend money on ridiculous things even though they're completely broke, and of course, drink wine while kicking back on a giant hammock. But at the core of all these doings is a post-college anxiety and coming-of-age existential dread, which slowly emerges as the characters go through the motions. Hall of Center's films and the identity of her characters and the things they worry about changed as the filmmaker also changed. Friends with Money centers around economic preoccupations and what money means to friends of a different economic standing. Lovely and Amazing spends a lot of time thinking about how people see themselves, be it through their art or their physical body. And her most recent work, You Hurt My Feelings, tackles how far is too far when it comes to honesty in a marriage. Uniting all these movies, as well as LF Center's body of work, are scenes of people in mundane environments talking to each other about what's on their mind. It's Hall of Center's own point of view and curious, fascinating, ever-evolving way of seeing life that ultimately gives her movies such a distinct and approachable quality. A lot of first movies from writer-directors that we now know and love also share the distinction of being prime hangout cinema. Perhaps the most iconic is Clerks by Kevin Smith, which also happens to be one of the poster movies for the indie movement of the 1990s. Smith ended up taking advantage of the indie boom and the success of his particular brand of hard-edged, talkative comedy to make a career out of people philosophizing about everything and anything, often with sexual and religious connotations. The fuck you doing up there? Yo, if you're gonna jump me to crack at that pussy first. But it's also worth highlighting F. Gary Gray's Friday, Greg Matola's The Day Trippers, Claudia Whale's Girlfriends, Edward Burns's The Brothers McMullen, and Jim Jarmusch's Permanent Vacation. All debuts that live largely off people spending time together, going on misadventures, and learning something new about themselves. Other notable entries in the Hangout movie canon include Doug Lyman's Swingers, which helped mythologize going to Vegas with friends, Alan Moyle's Empire Records, that pit the little guy against the man in the most 1990s selling out way possible, and Mike Nichols' Carnal Knowledge, a movie that helped shape the modern, neurotic, and anxiety-driven rom-com. After all, it's about overthinkers obsessing over what happiness is, based on their profoundly distorted vision of a meaningful and happy life, which is all rooted in their own privilege and entitlement. That feels very much like a precursor to Noah Baumbach, Whit Stillman, and of course Woody Allen, whose own body of work fits perfectly within this type of movie too. On the foreign cinema front, it's hard to forget the works of Eric Romer and Michelangelo Antonioni, from Paulina at the Beach to La Notte, and from A Summer's Tale de l'Aventura, they offer a completely unique palette in which characters veer from the intellectual to the emotional with ease. Romare tends to be more straightforward while Antonioni appreciates ambiguity, but in both filmmakers' cinema, the characters in their lives are rich and complex, and often defined by how they relate to the people they have emotional ties with. The cinema of Quentin Tarantino has been extensively covered elsewhere, but it'd be impossible to tackle movies about people hanging out and not mention the seismic influence that both Reservoir Dogs and especially Pulp Fiction had in modern movie making. Ditto for the work of John Cassavetes, which is entirely predicated on nuanced exploration of minds on the brink, often held together by the glue of friendship. The Coen brothers are also no strangers to this type of narrative, with The Big Lebowski being the obvious offering, although inside Lewin Davis, for example, also merits distinction. So much more could be said about this topic, and we haven't even covered the works of Wayne Wang, Alan Alda, Albert Brooks, Susan Seidelman, Neil Labute, and John Hughes, to mention just a few more names. This speaks to how much we love to see people hanging out in our movies, and how exciting it can be to connect to low-stakes life experiences. Want romance in Ridgemont? We can't even get cable TV here, Stacy. Want romance? In her book, Hanging Out, The Radical Power of Killing Time, Author Sheila Liming talks about how the act of hanging out is, in part, a manifesto to take back our social lives from the deadening world of contemporary life. After all, in a world obsessed with outputs and goals, there's a liberating quality, even freedom, in shedding societal obligations in service of pure, in-the-moment interactions that brings us closer to each other. Once again, cinema as the all-seeing and reflecting eye captures the joy of something that perhaps we don't do as much as we like, 
reminding us how gratifying and fulfilling these experiences ultimately are.